Welcome back, everyone, to the fifth and final session of Voices 2017, BOF's annual gathering for big thinkers. Once again, we're welcoming people from all around the world at, in New York, Istanbul, Berlin, Barcelona, and London. Uh, welcome to people at fashion schools around the world. Um, we've been having a great response to our live stream, and we're so glad you're sharing this experience with us. Use the hashtag BOF Voices. So, we've talked about the wider world. We've talked about inside the fashion system. We've talked about technology and innovation. This morning, we talked about building communities. But one of my favorite parts of Voices is live your best life. And if that sounds familiar, it's because I stole it from Oprah. Um, <laughs> I really did. I'm like, she, she, she kind of like mastered that. But anyway, in the, in the always-on digital world of today's fashion industry, it's even more important that we take time to take care of ourselves, to stay true to our sense of purpose and meaning, both personally and professionally, and to learn to navigate the challenges that will undoubtedly be thrown in front of us. Each of this afternoon's speakers have inspirational stories to tell and practical advice to give on how you can live your best life. Our first speaker is someone I first learned about in a Harvard Business School case study. There were so few cases that I was actually interested in at business school. So when this one came around, I paid very close attention. The protagonist in this case study was one Strauss Zelnick. It even sounds like a man's name from like some mysterious novel. He was a high-flying executive navigating digital disruption in the music industry. I was obsessed with this story as it contained all of the things that I was interested in. A global, a global business leader in a creative industry in the thick of technological disruption. Does that sound familiar? Then a couple of years ago, magically, a mutual friend mentioned to me that I should meet one of his mentors, and his name was Strauss Zelnick. I couldn't believe it. It was that same man from the case study, and when we met in person, he was even better in real life. Everyone knows how rare that is, right? Since then, Strauss and I have met regularly to, to discuss life and entrepreneurship, and as you'll learn, he has an amazing personal story of his own. So please join me in welcoming Strauss Zelnick. Thanks, Imran. Um, boy, I've had such a great time, and I've met so many of you. It's been incredible. I apologize for spilling the full cup of coffee just before I came up here. Um, <laughs> But when I was invited to the conference, uh, I was really thrilled. Uh, knowing less than zero about fashion or the business thereof, I figured, great, I'll spend a couple days in the English countryside with my wife, I'll get a bunch of exercise, and I'll sit quietly in the back, which I did, uh, listening and learning. It just, just seemed ideal. But naturally, there was a catch, which is that Imran asked me to speak. So I tried to weasel out of it with the old, uh, I'll just do the Q&A thing, like some people did. Um, but that didn't seem to work. So I defaulted to the late-night chat show gambit, which is pretend to talk about stuff other people care about, but actually use it the opportunity to market your upcoming book. Um, so my book is... <laughs> my book is entitled Becoming Ageless. And uh, unless my publisher finds something more important to focus on, which seems highly likely, um, it should be coming out next spring. And what I'm going to do today is give you a tiny preview. Now, the good news here is like all self-help books, you can generally get most of the benefit out of the introduction. So I'm going to save you the trouble and cost of a download. Uh, in a world that often defines and, and limits people by age, I believe that anything is possible at any time and that, it, that it's never too late to start, as long as you are kind to yourself, gentle, and you're willing to start slowly. I say that from the perspective of someone who, as a child, was known as precocious, as a young man was called a wunderkind, which I can pronounce, in middle age, started a new business, and someone today who's now, at best, in the second half of life, 
remains definitely unwilling to act my age. And I, I'm going to apply this lens to the three things I'm asked most often about, which Imran and I have spoken about, which is leadership, career success, and fitness. And I find that the filter of age uh, against those three things is on a good day irrelevant and on a bad day actually self-destructive. So let's start with leadership. Uh, it's a lovely picture of me looking, up, looking strong and in control. I like that picture, I like the earpiece. Um, it's very tempting here to de describe myself as a born leader, but it just wouldn't be true. In fact, as a kid, uh, I was, how do I put this politely, sort of a shithead. Um, um, I, I wasn't an athlete in a community where that was pretty much everything. So I protected myself with a hard shell and a wit often used at others' expenses. Uh, I was an outsider with predictable results. So I figured the best revenge, this is elementary school we're talking about, the best revenge was vast public glamour success. So I figured when I grow up, I'd be head of a movie studio. Now this from a kid who wasn't allowed to watch television uh, or movies uh, or read comic books. In fact, I only saw one movie by the age of 10, Fantasia. Uh, I hated it. Um, so I softened this act up in grad school, but it's fair to say that I was still totally focused on what I wanted all of the time. And I was vocal about it, I was unembarrassed about it. I even wrote an essay that was published in my first year of school about how I intended to be, yes, head of a movie studio. I am reminded of this to this day by friends of, from school. And yet here I am, uh, age 33, having just been named president of 20th Century Fox. Now, I'd already succeeded in the film business. I was, I was president of my first studio when I was 29, the largest independent. So um, I was recruited to go out to LA, and I was thoroughly convinced I knew everything there was about motion pictures. What I didn't know is that there's a difference between the independent business and the major studio business. I get to Fox, and I'm kicking ass and taking names, and the phone stops ringing. The phone really stops ringing. And I basically got hazed, and finally my boss, I was a pretty famous guy, came to me and said, oh my God, you have no leadership skills. Um, so serendipitously, uh, two things. First of all, I'm a good listener. Secondly, I happened to run into the book, forgive me, How to Win Friends and Influence People at the airport, and I read it. If you haven't read it, read it. And it's terrible title notwithstanding, it basically teaches you to focus on the other person. Take a sincere interest in other people and let yourself go. And that's the beginning of leadership. When I entered the music business, also knowing nothing, a few years later, as chief executive of a, of a, a major record company back when that was not an oxymoron, I spent six months of listening before I did anything, and it worked out a whole lot better. So what is leadership? Having a plan, communicating it to a first-class team, engendering enthusiasm to pursue it, aligning economic interests, sharing the benefits, and being of service to your consumers, your shareholders, and your colleagues. And doing so with something I had altogether too little of, but which I've begun to develop some small measure of, humility. And that approach has led to the career I've had. So turning to career success, and I'm going to ask you guys a question quickly. What is the factor most highly correlated with career success? Anyone? I'll repeat it, so just shout it out. Anything. What? Money? Okay, that's usually the result of it, but okay. Anything else? The factor most highly correlated with getting career success? Hard work. Yes. Anything else? Knowledge? Education? One more? Innovation? Sorry? Let's try that in a language I get. Uh, curiosity. Thank you. All of those things absolutely are all helpful. I think the factor most highly correlated with getting what you want is knowing what you want. And for better or for worse, I knew what I wanted initially. And I achieved many, not all, but many of my goals much more quickly than I expected. So after seven years of running two movie studios, I shifted my focus to building my own diversified media company, and that's what I've tried to do ever since. Now listen, it's not been a linear upward sloping path, that's what my son Lucas thinks, <clears throat> and I've had uh, numerous missteps along the way and actually some massive failures. But over time, 
it's worked out pretty well. So in 2001, I started ZMC with $300,000, and here we are today with about $14 billion in assets, 5,100 employees, 50 offices in 18 countries, including this country. But more to the point, I love what I do almost every day. So when I was in business school, I had this annoying habit. I used to ask the CEOs who came to visit, <clears throat> like I did, what are your keys to success? And here's what I was told, and by everyone. First, listen with empathy. Second, work hard. Third, never compromise your integrity. It's all you have. So now, turning to fitness and athletics. You may ask how this follows logically from a discussion about leadership and career success. And for me, it's because, oddly, professional success actually came relatively easily. I knew what I wanted, I chose a field that was wide open to someone like me, and I was blessed with an array of opportunities and no small measure of luck. But remember when I said I wasn't an athletic kid, that was an understatement. The truth is, I not only wasn't athletic, I was apprehensive about even trying. And I was so afraid of not being perfect and being embarrassed that I didn't try. Now, I managed to stay in good enough shape not to get fat and to look okay in a suit, but that's about it. Here I am in my early 20s, and I stayed this weight until my early 30s. I started lifting weights about 45 minutes a week, the minimum I could get away with, and uh, that, that was it. By my mid-40s, I was about as fit as your average middle-aged guy. And <clears throat> coincident with some business success, which freed up a bit of my time, as well as some personal work in progress, I slowly, methodically began to pick up some more sports. But most importantly, I let go of how I looked doing them. I, it didn't bother me when a friend of mine said, when we started running together, uh, you actually look like a wounded animal. Um, <laughs> I was so impressed when he said, you don't anymore. Um, I, became, I became willing to look awkward. I became willing to fail. I, I started with cycling, because anyone can get on a bike and cycle. Then spin classes in the gym, like soul cycle. Then yoga, that was really challenging and remains challenging. Then high-intensity interval training, which we will be doing at 4 o'clock today, um, if you want to come. F boxing at a boxing gym where no one spoke English, they still don't sprinting, and most recently, squash. You don't want to watch me play squash. And the funny thing was, I not only got in better shape, I not only became reasonably proficient at most of the sports I pursued, if I were patient with myself, but actually, it turns out I'm a pretty good athlete. And that only became clear in the last five years, so here I am today at 60. And, and what's my... What's, the lighting, the lighting, the lighting is excellent. Uh, uh, the lighting is excellent. Um, and no, no, I'm not taking off my shirt now. Uh, so what's my takeaway? From my adventures in leadership, from my career, from my newfound love of and sort of aptitude for fitness, age is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It's a myth we're told and we tell ourselves. There's not much you're too young to do. There's not much too, that you're too old to do. In any case, why not try? I was so frustrated and patient early in my career when I was told I was too young to be president of a film studio. And you know what? As it turns out, I wasn't. And yet, whatever youthful success I had pales by comparison to a long list of incredible successes people have achieved at early ages. So this is Louis Braille, who invented his system of reading and writing for the blind when he was 15. Uh, there's Jordan Romero, the youngest person to climb Everest at 13. Bobby Fischer became a chess grandmaster chess grandmaster at 15, or Mark Zuckerberg, who founded Facebook uh, when he was 20, and today, 33, is one of the most successful people on Earth. It makes my being called a wunderkind uh, really silly by comparison. And incidentally, isn't it really pathetic for some old guy to dine out on his early achievements? I also noticed that I went from being young to being not young, right around 35, and by the time I was 40, many people around me had decided their choices were set and solidified, and that was what they were stuck doing, like it or not. That's when I started my business. Rodney Dangerfield, you may remember, got his first big break on The Ed Sullivan Show when he was 46, and like it or not, America's sitting president entered politics for the first time just a couple of years ago, and the election he won was his first at the age of 71. Like I said, like it or not. And now, at 60, I feel like it's actually just beginning for me. 
uh, my ability to develop leadership skills, my career and my focus on and abilities in athletics. Why not? If I'm wrong, I won't have hurt anyone. If I'm right, perhaps wonderful things lie ahead. So this isn't a household name, but this is John Goodenough. He was a key member of the team that invented the lithium-ion battery in 1980. He was 58 years old. Well, more recently, in 2016, he invented what is now known as the glass battery, which may well be the winning technology for batteries of the future. He's 94. He's still on the faculty at the University of Texas. So today, what do I wish for you? Know what you want. Be focused and yet open-minded. Try to let go of the fears that hold you back. Start small, but start today, and don't judge yourself. And remember, at any age, anything is possible. Thank you. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So the first time I met Strauss, I was kind of I just realized you asked me that question before, like, what's the most important predictor of success? And I think the first time I also said hard works, I'd forgotten <laughs> knowing what you want. But it makes, it, it makes so much sense that if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, it's much harder to achieve it, right? But I think, you know, probably one, one of the things a lot of people can relate to in this room is um, about their fitness. And it's something that came to you relatively late in your life. You know, what's the advice that you give to people who are yearning for a more active, healthy lifestyle, but are busy, inundated with work, have families to manage, you know, they're tired, they just they can't find the time or the energy in a day to get to the gym or go to a yoga studio or whatever. Like, how do you overcome that bit? Well, so you know those magazines and websites that say how to get washboard abs in three weeks? Yeah, don't read those, because it's not possible. So what you have to do is just let go. You have to start really small. When I started training, I was uh, 22, I was in grad school, and the reason I did is that a friend of mine sort of looked across the room and said to me, you have a paunch. And I was like, I've always been skinny. He was like, yeah, you may be skinny, but you have a paunch. Um, and I knew like training was really scary to me. So I started doing 10 minutes of calisthenics, you know, push-ups, pull-ups to the extent I could, and sit-ups at home. By yourself. Um, by myself, 10 minutes a day, twice a week. So what I tell people is start really small. To, say you're going to take a 30-minute walk once a week, something that is so easy and so manageable that it won't bother you. And then what you'll find is if you stick with that, uh, then you slowly add more. But how do you stick with it, right? So well, people... 30 minutes of walking a week, you know, yeah. you set the bar so low that even you can't... <laughs> I don't mean you. Even I, even I. So look, I just, I just picked up squash, and uh, you know, it's hard for me, because um, eye hand is not super easy for me. So what do I do? I take one lesson a week with a squash pro. I don't take five. I didn't say, and my wife said, how are you doing? And she expected me to say, was, I'm doing great, I'm improving, it's awesome. And what I said was, I'm horribly pathetic, but I'm enjoying it, and it's once a week, and you know what, if I keep it up in a year, I'll be able to play squash. But I'm enjoying it, I'm enjoying it. That's the key thing. Uh, can, we lift, can we lift the house lights really quickly? Does anyone else have a, a question about... Yeah, Andres. Let's, let's get Andres over there. Wait, j let's just wait till you get a microphone. Piers, can you just pass that over quickly? Quick. We just want the, the viewers on the live stream to hear you too, Andres. Sure. Thank you. So, so Strauss, you, you mentioned you started 10 minutes a day or, or a couple times a week at home doing calisthenics. But how important is community? to you uh, in, your, in your fitness regimen these days and, and, and to keep you motivated. So th thank you for that. I mean, it's all about community for me. Many of my friends are in the fitness world and I do most, no, I do all my training with someone else. So I train with Eric Krakowski who's here. I'm training at four o'clock with everyone. Everyone's coming. Um, and in New York, I'm part of something called the program, which is a morning training group. And we get together four mornings a week and we train together and it's awesome. And everyone's, I think they're all like a third of my age. And, and I hold my own, which is incredible to me, so, and joyful. Any other questions, quickly? What about food? What about food? <laughs> Did you see me eating a Danish this morning? Uh, I, I, look, um, you know what you're supposed to eat and what you're not supposed to eat, but you gotta live and enjoy yourself. And by the way, if you train really hard, you can have a Danish now and then. All right. 
Thanks, Travis. Thanks. 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 Thanks.